So, back in the Cold War gallery, picking up where I left to go to the movie. Come over here with a Convair F-102 Delta Dagger. And overhead is a U-2. Unfortunately, the way it's illuminated, it's hard to see anything except the bottom of one wing. And of course, there's a SR-71 here. <laughs> and sitting here rather stealthily is the... Uh, is it Northrop who built this thing? I forget. The stealth bomber, certainly, but I don't remember what the manufacturer is. Oh, that's right, it's Northrop Grumman. Anyway, the B-2. And we're sitting here under a, a B-1 bomber. Again, I'm sure it's showing up as dark on dark. One thing I always get a kick out of on these is whether a museum decides to list the original manufacturer of an artifact or if they list the manufacturer that bought out the original manufacturer, in this case Boeing B1B. As I recall it was not originally a Boeing product but it got absorbed. This is an F-15 Eagle. And a Sikorsky MH-53M Pave Low. I thought this was an exceptionally neat helicopter. And overhead are a number of aerial torpedoes, flying missiles, and various unmanned aircraft. Over here is an F-111. We've already seen this before, but in another gallery. And here's the Bell CV-22B Osprey, now part of Boeing. And over here, I'm not sure why it's in the Cold War gallery, but a P-38. Hiding in the darkness. And a Panavia tornado from Desert Storm. 
And what do we have back here? Another uh, F-111, I think. Here's the uh, A-10 Thunderbolt, better known as the Warthog, product of Fairchild Republic. And sitting over here is the uh, C-130, specifically the AC-130A Spectre. It's a gunship. Azrael, Angel of Death. Here's a MiG-29 Fulcrum. And we've been waltzing around the outside of a C-133. Hopefully we'll get a better view of that. And here's the uh, Stealth Fighter. the F117 and here's another MiG the MiG 23 flogger there's several interesting airplanes up overhead but they're in total darkness so I wouldn't be able to get them in the video More of the C-133. Here's a McDonnell Douglas F, or rather RF, 4C Phantom II. Still the C-133 hanging overhead, but everything here. And here's the uh, McDonnell Douglas F-4G Wild Weasel. And there's a, a T-37 Tweety Bird hanging up in the darkness. And here's an F-101 Voodoo. And a Lockheed F-104 Starfighter. I think it's the only one in the collection here. And up overhead is a Ryan BQM-34 Fire Bee. This is an F-106 Delta Dart. And loitering overhead with the signage in the dark. is the Martin RB-57D. Already 
already mentioned the SR-71. And uh, here's the front end of the C-133. One of my favorite cargo planes. Too few of these are in museums, but there are a few around. These things were rather rushed into service, kind of filling the gap between the older cargo planes like the C-124 and then the C-5, an interim aircraft. Went right into production without a prototype stage. They had a number of issues, fatigue issues. Some of them just fell out of the sky and semi-unexplained circumstances. They were apparently exceptionally loud inside uh, and they had issues like this side door on the side. Um, the fuselage was not stiff enough and um, you couldn't always close the side door because of the torquing of the fuselage and they would taxi around with the crew pulling on the door until the fuselage finally flexed in the right direction to allow the door to close things like that and they put all these strengthening bands around the fuselage especially just forward of the wing which was considered to be a particularly weak area the um, supersonic vortices thrown off by the tips of the propellers impacted the fuselage as if it was being bombarded by huge ball bearings or something and it was definitely loud inside so uh, it was not a pleasant airplane to be in unless you were up in the cockpit area Still, it did a huge service for many years before being retired. The last one had been in civilian service in Alaska and was just a few years ago flown down to Travis Air Force Base where it's in the museum there. And there's videos on YouTube of that one flying. So we're heading out of the Cold War gallery here. A couple more planes on the way out. I don't believe I covered the B-47 or in specifically the RB-47H. Stratojet that sits up above us here. Once again, and I hate to keep complaining, but uh, it's really hard to see these, the way this place is lit up. I sincerely hope they make some renovations. In between hangars three and four is the missile gallery. When the museum first started moving into its current set of buildings, when it was just hangar one, all the missiles they had were outdoors in front, exposed to the weather, and uh, eventually they built this missile gallery and move the missiles in here and added a few more that weren't there originally. There is a mezzanine here for a better view. There's a uh, satellite here. Is a Thor Aegina here.
This is a Titan 1. And this is a Titan 2 ICBM. I've always had a lot of interest in this particular missile or rocket. And I'd only learned when I read up on it a bit more that what appears to be a twin engine design is actually a single engine, but it has two bells on it, so it's considered a single engine stage. And this is the Thor. Let's go upstairs. And this is a Minuteman 1. And a Jupiter. And uh, this is an elevator. And there's both an upper lower level walkway over to Hangar 4. There's a lot of experimental aircraft on this side, as well as some more rockets. And another uh, SR-71 type. Um, that may actually be a YF-12 there. I believe that's what it is, actually. And uh, not a flying space shuttle, but a, uh, a mock-up. And a few more cargo airplanes over here. And then the set of presidential airplanes, the various Air Force One types. But I'm going to visit this in detail later on. And right now, I'm going to go to the cafe. It's about one in the afternoon. I've been walking around all morning need to get some sustenance. Then there will be another movie and then I'll come back here and do a walk around of Hangar 4 and then out to the uh, outside hangars I think. Or not the outside hangars, the outside display on the ramp and the uh, World War II British airfield uh, buildings, the Quonset Huts and so on that are over there. There's a small cafe up here, but it's not the real cafe. It does save you the walk all the way back to the main cafe, though. And there is a bit of a mezzanine just for Hangar 3, which is accessed from this smaller cafe. And you do get to get a better view of the uh, B-36 here than you can possibly get from the floor. And there's better lighting on top of the B-2. And they, some of the other planes are still in the dark. The C-133 is a little easier to see here. So,
I don't mind taking the stairs. And off to the cafe. In between hangars one and two is the Aviation Hall of Fame, the National Aviation Hall of Fame, rather, which we might be able to stop in later on. They have an auditorium here called the Kearney Auditorium, and that used to be where they would show the movies before they got the IMAX theater. I guess they just use it for miscellaneous things now. But just outside the gift shop, on both sides of it, are stairs going up to the cafe, the Valkyrie Cafe. Still a beautiful day out there. Well, with uh, a bit of a late lunch over with now and still an hour to go before my second movie and plenty of time to see Hangar 4, I've decided to go to the outdoor ramp first. So, let's go down there now. go out there? You can, but you know you didn't park on this side. I know. All right, then when you come back, you had to come back and go through security. Oh, okay. So I got to walk back around that side when Co I come back in. Correct. But there's no other way to get to that apron then, right? Other than parking on that side? Correct. We usually okay. tell people, get back in the vehicles, drive and park over there on, on when they're getting ready to leave. Mm -hmm. If not, you'd be walking four football fields. Yeah. Well, I'm a good walker. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Enjoy yourself. Thank you. No problem. Oops. It's a little slow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you just push that open. The weather around here has been amazing in the Midwest probably outside the Midwest too, but here it is rolling up toward the end of October. And this is the kind of weather you'd expect to get in, say, early September. <clears throat> Temperatures in a balmy but not hot range. I would say somewhere in the mid-70s Fahrenheit. Incredible for this time. some hangers way on the far side over there. I'm not sure if those are the ones or not, but there used to be a set of three or four hangers that were side by side over in that general neck of the woods, which is where they used to have the experimental airplanes and the presidential airplanes before they built Hangar 4 and could move them over here. So I'm not sure if the ones I just showed were the same ones or if it's some other ones blocked by the trees. But that is Wright Patterson Air Force Base over there. And it was always tricky getting over there before, before they built Hangar 4. And that was because that's an active Air Force Base. 
and they uh, excluded people from going over there unless they were U.S. citizens. So I was here many times before when visitors from Europe, for example, would come in because they couldn't show a U.S. passport or a U.S. driver's license. They were prevented from going over to see the presidential and experimental aircraft. <clears throat> and they also had periods where their funding was such that uh, you had to take a bus over there instead of driving over on your own. They couldn't handle the security, and then they wouldn't have funding for the bus the next time I would come. And then you had to go over, but you had to get special permits and so on to drive over in your own car. And it's definitely something that many people were not able to see before it was moved over here to the new Hangar 4. So this whole apron that I'm walking on here now used to be covered with airplanes. The B-52 that we saw used to be out here for many years, sitting over there kind of almost on what's the grass now. <clears throat> so it seems like they, when they get new airplanes, airplanes they're not quite sure what to do with. This is where they put them until they can move them somewhere. <clears throat> but definitely now it's what, one, two, three, five airplanes out here. Definitely less busy than it was before. So this airplane is a Lockheed C-60 Lodestar. I'm sure it's a perfectly good airplane, but I always thought these looked a little unwieldy. This is a Northrop YC-125B Raider. Almost looks like it's supposed to sit down on the water, but not quite. Durante airplane. This is a uh, Boeing, <clears throat> excuse me, a Boeing EC 135E, so called the Aria. It's basically a, I believe it's a 707 with this uh, big radome on the front mobile tracking and telemetry platform to support the Apollo space program and some other unmanned space programs as well. So this is a combination of NASA and Department of Defense and they contracted with McDonnell Douglas and Bendix to modify eight of the Boeing C-135 Stratolifter cargo aircraft into this particular variant. Kind of like the uh, engine covers saying bird of prey on there. <clears throat> and over here we've got a C-17. These are still active in the Air Force, very much active. And I'm kind of surprised they have one here on display. I'm guessing this must be a pretty early one if they've retired it already. This 
So what's it say about this one? So it's a C17 Globemaster 3, entered service in 1993. The one on display is the prototype. Okay, that's why it's here. This is the prototype. Built by Douglas, which is now Boeing. It was the first test article and first flew in 1991. And after it was finished with its flight test program, it supported other flight test and propulsion test programs for the Air Force, NASA, and others. And it appeared in a number of motion pictures, according to this. It appeared in Transformers in 2007, Transformers Revenge of the Fallen in 2009, Iron Man in 2008, and Iron Man 2 in 2010. After 20 years of wide-ranging flight tests, it had reached the end of its flying career and was retired to Edwards Air Force Base in 2011, and then it was flown to the museum in 2012. So, how about that? It's a movie star. So now there's the museum way back in the distance and have to hoof back there. They do allow you to park a little closer. You can go back to your vehicles on the far side of the museum and drive around park a little bit closer, but you still have to be able to do some hoofing to get out here. You can't drive out here close to the airplanes for sure. American Air Forces in England World War II exhibit. Hi. sound effects and hear the sound of aircraft starting up outside and so on. Pretty well done. Not a lot to see here other than a few informational posters on the wall, but still. So here's the, the tower. Not sure which door lets us in. We'll try them until something opens. Not that one. Control tower is dedicated to all 8th Air Force veterans of World War II and the 26,000 airmen killed. Thank you. 
This looks strangely like the room downstairs. It's a little bit Spartan in here. I think it would have been considerably different during the war. I think it would be great if they could really get this mocked up like a real hangar and have uniformed people going through the motions, but I'm sure that would cost a boatload. told that this particular facility here, this building is very popular with visitors from, from England, they, especially the older ones who remember the airfields. I should mention that the Air Force Museum is free admission. There's no charge to come in at all. There is a charge for the food, of course, or if you go to the movie, or the gift shop, but pure admission to the museum is free for everybody. And now I'm coming back around through the security entrance. Okay, my second movie was about D-Day, and it's really an excellent production. And uh, I think I saw the same one at the National Air and Space Museum Udvarhazi facility when I was there last in their IMAX theater. I understand, by the way, that they don't actually show IMAX movies here at this museum anymore, that they uh, are showing non-IMAX films, but on a very large screen. So this is Hangar 4. Did the view of it before from above. So this is one of the uh, gondolas from one of the early efforts to get man to extended altitudes. That's uh, an Excelsior, Project Excelsior balloon gondola from uh, the 19, around 1960. And uh, overhead we have, I think it's a Titan II, or what is it? One of the, I'm sorry, Titan II, ridiculous, I know that's not right. It's a Titan IV which is the largest uh, rocket that the Air Force possesses.
Got solid rocket boosters and all, but at its core, it's got a Titan. I'm presuming this whole front section is payload. And then you've got a Titan rocket down at the core, which uh, no doubt provides most of the uh, steering and guidance. And then you've got a couple of solid rocket boosters strapped on each side of it to get the extra propulsion, but the Titan itself is in control of the stack. One of my favorites here is the Valkyrie, which used to be outside and has slowly been moved hangar to hangar. They had it over across in Wright-Patterson in the experimental aircraft hangar for many years. And then they moved it back here and it's been moved kind of down to the end hangar as they've added on to them. This is a reconnaissance satellite. in a film recovery vehicle. And another reconnaissance satellite. <clears throat> and this looks like a uh, the same engine that's used on the Titan the Aerojet LR87. As mentioned before, this is really one engine, but it has two bells. Over here they have a Fisher P75 Eagle, which was a uh, an interceptor from World War II. It's uh, experimental in nature, that's why it's in this hangar, because uh, this half of the hangar is experimental aircraft. There's a nice picture of the Valkyrie taking off. And there they have the Allison twin shaft V3420 engine that was used on the, uh, well, several uh, Air Force airplanes, I forget which ones. And here's a Bell P-59B era comet. And over here a Bell X-1B. And the Lockheed P-80. Overhead is a Northrop X-4. And here's a Convair XF-92. We're under the wing of the Valkyrie at this point. These wings did droop, so this whole section from the black line outboard would droop in flight. Here's a General Electric YJ93 GE3 turbojet engine. And here's the Douglas X3 Stiletto one of the experimental aircraft that would have been operated out of Edwards Air Force Base. Although, I, as I recall, it was sort of uh, disappointing because the power plant that was intended for it didn't materialize and it didn't really satisfy all the ambitions of its uh, program. Right above us is a Bell X-5, which is a uh, swing wing test plane. 
Here's a Westinghouse J34 engine. And one of my favorites is the McDonnell XF85 Goblin, which was intended to be carried in the bomb bay of some of the larger bombers and released in order to provide a transportable fighter plane that could defend the bigger airplanes. There's a Republic XF-84, which looks like it should be a jet aircraft, but actually has a propeller on the front. And hiding back around here is a North American X-10. Positioned so you can hardly see it. There's an Allison T-40 engine, and here's a North American F-107A. I'm never sure whether I think this is a cool-looking airplane or a dumb-looking one. This is the forward swept wing test aircraft. I forget its designation. Oh, it's an X-29. And this is one of the FICON aircraft, the Republic YRF-84F, which was intended to be tagged onto a larger aircraft and taken along for the ride. And this is the Lockheed D-21B, which could be hung under the wing of a B-52 and used for high-speed reconnaissance without being a manned vehicle. It was certainly related to the, or the um, SR-71 type aircraft. And we're still down here underneath the YB-70 Valkyrie, which is a very large aircraft and can't really get far enough away from it to get a good view. There's the sign for it. And here is the other aircraft that would be the experimental predecessor of the SR-71. And this is one that was in the experimental hangars for most of the time until it got moved here. And it's the XF-12A. Or I'm sorry, the YF-12A. I don't know if I said XF before. They have a 360 degree cockpit app that you can get for your phone or iPad type and uh, it lets you look inside certain select airplanes in the museum as you go by them. This is uh, the Bell Helicopter Textron XV-3. This is one of those that was used to get early data on what eventually became the Osprey that the uh, Marines operate today. Tilt rotor aircraft that could transition from vertical to horizontal flight using the same set of rotors. And I hadn't touched on the Republic XF-91 Thunder Scepter.
There's a whole bunch of experimental land production drones and small helicopters up above. This guy up here is a Fairchild XS X SM-73 Bull Goose, a pilotless decoy missile from the uh, 1950s. And this guy here is a Ryan X-13 Vertijet, which could take off vertically from a uh, launch trailer that transitioned to vertical just like this. And it could take off vertically and then come back and land on it. Um, they did operate it, but it was just a purely uh, experimental craft to learn more about that type of flight. And here is the Hawker Sidley XV-6A Kestrel, which is uh, something that eventually turned into the Harrier type aircraft. And this weird looking plane that looks like it couldn't have flown is the Northrop Tacit Blue, a very secret uh, experimental aircraft in stealth technology. And if you don't think the Air Force ever had flying saucers, here's one of them, sort of. I don't believe this ever got more than a few feet off the ground, but it did fly. Built by Avro. And over here we have a Lockheed NT-33A. And this is the Convair NC-131H, which is a total in-flight simulator. So they took a standard Convair uh, aircraft and bolted on this extra section in front that would uh, allow the entire aircraft to be flown as if it was a different type of airplane for training the, uh, the pilots. And they used various methods to simulate the handling of the aircraft, uh, different from the base con bear on which it was built. This is a uh, NASA slash Boeing X-36. And over here is a General Dynamics NF-16A. And another view of the uh, Convair total in-flight simulator. Notice the extra flight controls out on the wings. It would help it simulate different types of aircraft. And this beauty here is the Fairchild C-119 flying boxcar, one of my favorites. This one was outside for the longest time on the air park before being brought in and restored. Over here across the way is an XC-142, another tilt rotor experimental aircraft.
So it looks like maybe you can go into this one. Let's see what goes on there. This is the C82 packet. Everything nicely plexiglassed or Lexand off, so you can't touch anything. Not much to see in here, it's a very Spartan airplane. And there is uh, the hatches to the front including the little urinal there. The uh, very limited sanitary facilities. And the cockpit is not visible from here. So not that much to see there, but still interesting. This is the Boeing X-45A Joint Unmanned Combat Air System. Here's yet another C-130 based airframe. This one's the I think this one seems more like the plain vanilla version. It's not a gunship. And uh, hanging up above us is the Lockheed Martin RQ-3 Dark Star. Highly advanced stealthy reconnaissance remotely piloted aircraft. Hard to get a good view of it. And this is, I believe, the C-141 that's called the Hanoi Taxi. When I lived at Scott Air Force Base, it seemed like there were C-141s taking off about every 10 minutes. Of course, that was quite a long time ago. I'm not positive, and maybe there will be a sign saying something about it, but I seem to recall this was the last C-141 to fly. I don't see any signage for it. This is, of course, the heavy lift cargo plane that the Air Force had before the C-5 came out. I was told by one of the docents that this hangar has enough room for the 747 Air Force One aircraft when it gets retired, that they have already mapped out how to rearrange the planes to fit it in here. I don't know what they're going to do when they have to put a C5 in here, huh? Probably have to build another hangar. Another flight simulator. Okay, now we're coming around the back of the C141. And it looks like they're letting people inside of here too. Oh, here it has the sign. It's on a box. Thank you. 
So the C-141 is clearly a much smaller airplane than the C-5, only a fraction of the width, but configuration very similar. Got all the fabric crew seats along the walls. Along with oxygen masks. And as demonstrated here, they could put in airline type seating, at least some of it. I'm not sure if that's where the officers sat or how they worked that. And you had your uh, military latrine there. A lot of people sign this thing in your cockpit up there. Um, at least one observer seat, a navigator, radio operator seat. There's probably a flight engineer on the other side, plus the two pilots. So now we're out of the experimental and oddball category and into the presidential aircraft part of the hangar. This is the uh, VC-54C Sacred Cows chairlift. which allowed uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt, who was bound to his wheelchair, to get in and out of the plane more ceremoniously than being carried up the stairs. I did overlook the C-21A Learjet, which was used, uh, I believe, primarily for executive transport. It had to be a little bit demeaning for generals and so on to uh, have to scrunch down and fit in there because the Learjet was notoriously short on headroom. And here's the 707 based. Um, I forget what they call it in its military designation, we'll find out, but used as Air Force One. So, as pointed out before, this is the Sacred Cow, a uh, VC-54C Skymaster built by Douglas. Basically a C-54 fuselage fitted with wings from a C-54, a, a C-54B to get greater fuel capacity and had an unpressurized cabin. They have that little gateway there because that's how narrow it is on board. They don't want people to go all the way up the stairs and then get stuck in the narrow passageways. It's like being on a train. This was the 
executive office while on board the plane. It takes up almost the entire width of the airplane. There's the rear lavatory and so on, and a few more seats, and the uh, presidential elevator. And this is the Douglas VC-118, known as the Independence. This was Truman's aircraft. Oh, wow. Mom can't go nowhere yet. Oh, nice. He's filming. Look at the cockpit. Look at all the buttons. Look at it. Oh, yeah. He's probably pushing it. So that's like a radio? Yeah, this is a president's plane. Yeah. Yeah. These are much better presented now than they were when they were in the experimental hangar. In there they still had the, the plexiglass or Lexan panels, but they didn't have quite as much lights on inside. It was harder to see. Generally a better view in there now, and I think a lot higher traffic going through them as well because they're not in such a restricted area. This is a Gulfstream C20B that was used for uh, executive transport for many senior American leaders for a couple of decades. This particular aircraft did carry uh, President Clinton and uh, Presidents Carter, Ford, and H.W. Bush. 
carried presidential spouses, several secretaries of state and defense, foreign dignitaries, numerous high-ranking civilian officials, and military personnel. When it didn't make sense for one reason or another to use the, the bigger airplanes. Possibly sometimes because of which airports they were flying into, sometimes because the president might be on one of the other ones and they didn't really need to do that for the people who were transporting at the moment. This is another smaller executive transport. It's a Lockheed VC-140B Jetstar. Used for the same reasons. This uh, particular airplane carried uh, Richard Nixon, Gerald Ford, President Carter, and Ronald Reagan a number of times. Although it was never, of course, a primary, primarily presidential aircraft. And here's the Lockheed Constellation based presidential aircraft. I always have to avoid calling it Air Force One because, of course, it isn't unless he's aboard. It's a Lockheed VC 121E Columbine 3. I always thought the Constellation's a beautiful airplane, but I don't imagine it was that much fun to fly. The cockpit's really tiny for such a big airplane. thinks this is the one she's seen on TV. written a book about what that gal was saying that was wrong. Now I made my share of mistakes here today too. Speaking from memory and so on. So this is the most modern presidential aircraft. There's another one up there, the uh, <clears throat> Beechcraft VC-6 Ladybird Special, which often landed at uh, Johnson's Ranch, if I understand correctly. Here's a North American T-39A Sabre Liner. Served as an executive transport and a test bed for various technologies for many years. And the Aero Commander U-4B, also used as executive transport.
And then finally the Boeing VC-137C SAM 26000. This particular aircraft carried eight American presidents, Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, Ford, Carter, Reagan, George H.W. Bush, and Clinton. This is the one that President Kennedy flew to Berlin when he declared that he was Ich bin ein Berliner. Um, Oh, this one's the smallest yet. Yeah. Yeah. Feel the empty little. Can you pick it up? This is driving a your big communication center here. I don't know, that looks like a knee banger to me. And the fairly nice galley in here. And seating for top aids and so on. Walking through here with these Luxan panels, you get all charged up with static. And these benches along the wall. And of course the aisle jumps over to the side because of the wide executive rooms on the other side here. Special presidential lavatory, a couple executive chairs. I suppose a lot of these seats were for journalists that would follow the president around. And a uh, pretty good sized galley here to serve the better meals than normal airlines would offer. I think we've pretty well covered it here. There's an X-15 right here. And then they have a couple of the lifting body aircraft here, the Martin X-24A lifting body. And the uh, the Martin X-24B lifting body. 
And uh, I also miss the flown capsule they have here. I forget which one it is. Okay, this is the Apollo 15 command model, command module, Endeavor as it was called. This is the one that Dave Scott, Jim Irwin, and Al Warden flew on in 71. Of course, the uh, National Air and Space Museum in DC has another one. I believe that one's the Apollo 11. And offhand, I forget where the other flown capsules are. Maybe they're at the various NASA facilities. Probably are, I suppose. And here's a uh, Gemini. Manned orbiting laboratory spacecraft. Looks similar to other Gemini vehicles, but it has important differences, as the sign says here. The circular hatch leading from the crew compartment through the heat shield in the rear of the vehicle. It led to a tunnel which connected the craft to a 19-foot-long manned orbiting laboratory module where the crewmen were supposed to live and control reconnaissance cameras. They were supposed to be up there for about 30 days each time. They were supposed to be launched from Vandenberg Air Force Base instead of Cape Canaveral and they uh, pulled the program for budgetary and political reasons and never did uh, fly them. <clears throat> so the special hatch there leading out <coughs> through the heat shield is one of the things that distinguishes this from a regular Gemini. And it looks like they've got a Mercury over here too, which I missed before. This is a flight rated production vehicle that was never used. It was used to provide parts in support of the final Mercury mission in 1963. And that concludes my walk around of the National Museum of the United States Air Force. Still a lot of people coming in the door like they just arrived.